thank you very much. Yes, it was lovely. I had a, a chat to a couple of new people that have come for the first time and I welcomed them warmly and and then I told them how I'm hardly ever here and so they welcomed me back. It was really nice. It was like, oh yeah, it is really nice to be back. Um, yes, this idea that I might live close by and be at the centre more hasn't quite worked out. I'm at the airport a lot. So it's just really lovely to be here. So, and I've picked a pretty big topic to give a talk on, so I know there are... How many other people is it their first time here? Oh, quite a few. So, hopefully <coughs> I won't have you running screaming for the doors, <laughs> but um, I have picked quite a big topic for a sort of a, a regular Sangha night. I've called it 10 Days, One Bodhicitta. Um, and I am going to explore the word Bodhicitta a little bit, but um, I may also use some other terms that might just sort of go over your head. So just sort of see how you feel at the end of the talk rather than what you might know by the end of the talk. So some of it might not quite make sense. So this talk is exploring... Um, the pre it's my first go at exploring the precious time that I had in England when our teacher died. Um, and I'm going to link it to the bodhicitta, this, this word that I'll explain a little bit about. Hand up if you've ever, if you have heard of the word bodhicitta. So quite a few. Um, often you might even hear it or read it in our Dharma books as the, the arising of the bodhicitta or maybe even cultivating the conditions for the bodhicitta to arise. Hand up if you know what it means or sort of know what it means. Okay, yep, and I say sort of because it's a really hard thing to talk about and yet it's one of the most inspiring things about Dharma life and Dharma practice. And in some ways, even though some people might leave this talk not knowing really what I'm talking about, if it's their first night here, something actually got you to the centre. Something actually got you to that door and to have the courage to come in. And I think that's linked to the bodhicitta. And that may not make any sense at all. If you're still around in 10 years, you can, I'll be really old and even greyer, come and tell me, I think, I think that time you said, you might know more about the bodhicitta really. Not know, maybe um, there's a pull towards this amazing concept or this, um, uh, well, I better get and, and get in and explain it really, <laughs> what it is. Um, there's something there that draws us forward to a life of deeper meaning and um, understanding. And that's what brings us along to places like this. So I, the actual, one of the um, definitions that I, that I got out of a book, which I thought was quite succinct, is that the bodhicitta is a spontaneous wish to attain enlightenment or awakening, motivated by great compassion for all sentient beings, accompanied by a falling away of the attachment to the illusion of an inherently existing self. So it is not only a pull towards wanting to awaken and reach your individual potential as much as you can, um, you want to do that with others as well and for the sake of others but it also is this falling away of self-clinging, of this sort of internal I, me, mine. So this is what the bodhicitta is, it's this deep wish. And it permeates every aspect of the Mahayana teachings, a particular uh, aspect of our Buddhist teachings and practice. So broadly speaking, it's a quality rather than a thing, and many might say it is the very quality that moves us in the direction of awakening, of seeing things how they really are, with a capital R reality, with a capital R. So the actual word in Sanskrit, um, bodhicitta, is broken down into two parts. So bodhi means enlightenment or awakening, and citta means conscious mind, heart mind. So sometimes it's called awakened mind. Um, one of our order members in England, Parami, um, she often gives really inspiring talks about the bodhicitta and, and the bodhisattva path, and she prefers to use the translation of awakened heart, which I quite like as well. 
a fully awakened heart. Now, there's only one bodhicitta, and I, I don't know if anyone else here has heard Parami sing it, but what is that song she sings it to? There's only one bodhicitta. There's only one bodhicitta. There's only one bodhicitta. What is that song? Does anyone know that tune? That's it. That's it. That's it. So that's she often sings that, and so there's there's only one bodhicitta, and you know, I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's always helpful for me when that tune comes to mind. So de- dependent on certain conditions, bodhicitta can arise. It's not something we personally attain. We don't go out and get it. So I'm going to sit on the mat and go and get bodhicitta. It's not something like that. But it's also not something that is beyond each of us individually. It does involve us. So bodhicitta is already there. It is a fabric of reality that we're actually often just day by day, minute by minute, missing its existence because of our self-clinging because all of our energy is going into seeing through these eyes as if I'm separate from this person and that person and that I need to look after my needs to actually be happy. So that's when we miss this existence of bodhicitta. So our task is to be open to it, to to align ourselves to it and serve it with our actions and uh, our speech and our mind. So normally, uh, on a day-to-day basis, we forget uh, to be aware of the fragility of our own beating hearts. Mm -hmm. Usually we're living up here, you know, planning, rehearsing, Mm -hmm. scheming, (laughs) um, all of those things. Um, So one of our practices, mindfulness of breathing, you often can slowly become aware of your own beating heart. But when the bodhicitta has arisen, or we've actually quietened down the self-clinging, the egos and we're aware of it, it's like instantaneously being um, aware of all beating hearts, of all sentient beings. It is truly a beautiful experience. Um, What do I want to say about that? Yeah, so when that happens, we literally literally, literally have a realisation that we cannot anymore, or at least in that moment, only think of our own liberation from suffering. So the, the, the drivenness to actually get out of suffering ourselves no longer can be just linear for me. It, it actually includes all sentient beings. So bodhicitta as awakening mind heart is the intention to awaken to life fully in order to help others awaken fully. So it's not simply a feeling or an emotion or a sentiment. It has this vertical dimension that runs at right angles to our usual social conditioning and it embraces a knowing or a seeing into the nature of experience itself. A friend of mine in England, Vajrasara, gave a talk on the myth of bodhicitta and she talked about the heart of bodhicitta as a paradox. It's beyond individual self-clinging it's a first force that works through you for the benefit, benefit, benefit of all, but it also involves you. It's a very active state. Sorry, just a bit. And she reminds us that the great Dharma teacher Shanti Deva, in an inspiring text some of you will know called the Bodhicharya Vatara, speaks about it in a really enlivening way. And he goes on, he's, um, he's from like 700 CE or something, this teacher. But he goes on to talk about the world being made up of one body. So we, we are one body and we, we can often be very aware of our own body. And he says, well, we wouldn't attack our other hand in our body, like it's interconnected. And this is how we need to see the world. Why would you seek happiness just for yourself in this world? when we are all interconnected. An effective Buddhist response to to suffering um, of ourselves and others can only be through love mode, not power mode. So bodhicitta arises through each of us on the basis of a developing faith, compassion and wisdom. 
we do the work, uh, the transforming work that we do in these shrine rooms and on retreats and through friendship, um, clearing away all the wrong views and habits and trying to loosen our sense of fixed self, our independent, isolated self. And then something starts to happen, seemingly magically, when all the right conditions come together. We experience a different state of consciousness about how we are and how others are. So we're trying to get our heads and hearts around, when trying to get our heads and hearts around the teaching of the bodhicitta, we can veer sometimes to um, polar opposites, to unhelpful ends of the spectrum. Because it is quite, it is quite a hard teaching to sort of think about. It's a bit like it has to be experienced. So we can either um, focus too much on it as a transcendental state, which it is actually. It's beyond just what we're made up of. It can seem so far away that we think of it um, as an unachievable goal. So we read it about it in the Buddhist books. We even talk about it in study groups. But we actually don't seriously think we're going to ever experience bodhicitta. So we can think it's nothing possibly we could be even close to, especially when we look at our daily actions and you know how hard it is even to try not to harm other human beings and how far we are from that goal. So we can think, well, bodhicitta, well, that's sort of for those yogis or something. So that's one end of the spectrum that can be not helpful to focus on. Um, and the other one really is that we think it's something we can tap into easily, that we're at the other end of the spectrum going, oh, yeah, I know that feeling. It's a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. I get that sometimes when my friends do something nice with me and we don't have any fights, that sort of thing. It's, it's easy to confuse it with what might be a sense of everyday sort of good niceness or inter interconnected or connectedness. But it's far more than ordinary goodness or even skilful intention. The arising of the bodhicitta or awakened heart-mind, involves a state that's outside the limitations of what we're usually conscious of. Me here, you there, fixed, separate entities. It involves a lived experience, even if momentarily, of the truth of interconnectedness, uh, impermanence, um, an acknowledgement that suffering and unsatisfactoriness will happen. And it's also a, a state deeply connected to a wish to want to ease suffering for ourselves and others. We don't leave ourselves out. So our teacher and founder of this order, um, the Tree Ratna Order, Sangharakshita, has said that the bodhicitta is more likely, the state of bodhicitta is more likely to arise in collective contexts with others. And Parami, my friend in the UK, she says she thinks the bodhicitta is the governing principle of our order, that all of the teachings we pick up and use, all of the aims we have are governed by this wish to attain awakening so it can be for the benefit of all. And I've also heard our international order convener um, say that he thinks we are a bodhicitta order, not fully realised yet. We're not a bunch of bodhisattvas yet. Um, but I do think he, he's right. I think we are an aspiring order, uh, trying to operate in a way where the bodhicitta has a good chance of arising. And so that's why I want to move into the next part of the talk. I want to talk about a particular 10-day period last year in the UK. So this um, was a time when our teacher, Sangharakshita, the founder of our order, on Wednesday the 30th of October last year, died at uh, 93 years of age. He lived on a property called Adastana, which is our sort of, I'm not sure, sort of retreat centre come headquarters, um, a, a place where lots happens, but um, all sorts of things happen, retreats, meetings... And he lived there, he wanted to die there, um, and he's buried there as well. And Apada, 
here. Um, my older brother and I were there on a course at the time, and I'll tell you a little bit about what happened there. We were on a one-month international course. Um, we've both been asked to go and attend this course and sort of be challenged and poked and prodded and... Um, yeah, it was wonderful. It was a very stimulating course. And we were living there with lots of activities going on there, um, lots of order members who have responsibilities in our order live on site there and uh, have the you know, communities there as well. And one afternoon um, towards the end of the course, we, we heard that um, Sangarakshita was ill and he was going to hospital by ambulance. Um, he knew apparently that he'd become unwell um, with possibly pneumonia and a complicating infection. So uh, a visiting doctor had come out to where he was in the annex and recommended that he go into hospital. And uh, he looked at her from what we heard from the person who was with him and said, is this potentially fatal? And although she was a bit taken back and said, oh, we don't usually answer those sorts of questions, um, she just, yeah, saw that he really wanted to know the answer and he said it could, she said, yes, it could be. So he turned to his assistant and asked if his assistant could go and get his mala beads for him, sort of like beads that go around the neck. Um, they would be very important to him. So he asked if they could be collected to take with him. And also that his uh, good friend would re perhaps remember, try and remember to return the talking library books that had just arrived for his next month of listening because he had an eye condition. So he used to listen to books um, to make sure they were returned. And then they headed off in the ambulance to the hospital. And a couple of close friends uh, drove to the hospital and meditated in the room overnight. And we went about our business at, at uh, Adistana, just mm -hmm. uh, getting ready for the next day of our course, which was, I think, only two days from ending. And uh, Parami came and told us that, you know, they'd heard that he was going to die that day, that they were stopping all medication, and perhaps we should gather the 14 of us and go into the shrine room and start chanting the chants that he'd asked for, for his death. And it seemed, I don't know how long it was, but it seemed like about five or ten minutes and she was back. Like we had just gathered the 14 of us and she was back saying, actually, Bounty's died. And so, yeah, it just happened very quickly then. So Bounty had just had one of his most prolific years in terms of actually meetings with people, which is pretty amazing at 93. Um, in terms of personal one-to-one -one meetings, he was seeing people a lot um, and he recently commented to someone that this last year that he was in had been one of the happiest years of his life. And I think that's pretty amazing at 93 to really feel that. And I'd actually visited him 13 days before he died. I'd asked for a meeting and seen him and there was no uh, sign then that he was so ill he was going to die. So it was 10 days from his death uh, to when they had the funeral on Sunday the 10th of November. And something, from my perspective, something very extraordinary happened in that time. Did we collectively, all of the people on that site, experience the rising of the Bodhicitta? Um, we don't tend to talk of it in terms of, yes, this definitely happened or that didn't happen. Perhaps of more use than perhaps tying down the experience with a name or a final word. I'll just try and give you a sense of some of the conditions that were present in those 10 days. So 14 of us were on the course. We weren't the only people on the site. Um, and we were representing the main regions in Tree Ratna order. So from all around the world, there were people on the course from Australia, Upper and I and Sudrishti, from Ireland, England, India, Sweden, Germany, United States and Mexico. Um, half men. <coughs> from the men's order, half from the women's order, and we just lived together in this building on site and studied together. 
So in between, after um, our teacher had died, in between times, we, we in the shrine room and chanting, we would um, be in communication with our sanghas back out in the world. So, you know, Uppeter would be in contact with the centre here or we would be in contact with Sydney. And that was happening with all of the other um, main places in the world where our order exists. So it was a virtual Indra's net of connections happening around the world. Um, so Indra's net is a, an image that comes from some particular texts. It, it's a visual representation of interconnectedness and interpenetration of all things. It descri describes a jewelled net sp um, spreading out infinitely. And in each node of the net there's a, a perfect shining jewel. And each jewel reaches its infinite potential only when it's in reflection with the other jewels. So it's quite sort of perfect on its own, but it reaches its true potential as a shining jewel in relation to the other jewels in the net. And uh, there's a sort of an ultimate level of beauty that happens with that. So I've always seen this Im image as re uh, reflecting our sangha or our spiritual community at its best. It's a bit like we are, yes, we, we often can do better, but when we're actually in relationship to other, we often sort of find ourselves drawn up to, to our best. So I think in, in another way, it is a way of describing um, bodhicitta. So as news got out of our teacher's death, um, lots of communications were happening around the world and massive numbers of people started to come together at their centres. I was trying to remember how many they said in India, Apada, do you remember? Mm. It was th like thousands, mm. I don't know if it was like 30,000, 40,000 on that first night just came from all their villages and to one of the big centres in India. They just heard and they just moved. Um, and most centres around the world, people just, certainly the order, just went to their centres and started practising. So this is, these are some of the conditions that were happening in these 10 days. So here at Adastana, or there at Adastana, we, they, we had this bunch of people communi communicating with each other while also connecting via shared practices and shared vision. So many people who were there later talked about that period of time as having a magical quality, a special something other arising a beautiful flow of sort of being in a realm of interconnectedness. There was a stream of just knowing what to do, um, how to respond, even without talking a lot about anything, although it was very well planned, the, the uh, things that had to happen after he died. It just sort of unfolded in this very beautiful way. way. There was sort of like an unlimited willingness to just do what needed doing. It was just very pure. It was a lifting up of all of us to be fully alive at our best and our higher selves. And it was sort of like a vital mutual responsiveness. So that's the alive quality. We were highly attuned to our mutual aspirations and our inspirations. Um, it was embedded and sustained over that period of time in a way I certainly haven't experienced before. I've had glimpses of it and maybe even like days of it, um, but not necessarily in connection with large numbers of people in that way, with the shared vision. So it was amazing being surrounded by community members that were quite naturally operating in what we call love mode. So, so on a basis of not wanting to cause more harm from wanting to open the heart as much as possible with wisdom. Um, any sort of form of power mode or ego drivenness seemed to have dropped away quite naturally. Um, our tolerance levels uh, were very high for whatever had to be done. No one seemed to be experiencing the sort of normal rub you have about, oh, but I'm just tired. Really? 300 chairs now? You know, <laughs> in the barn? <laughs> You know, there was, there was just no ex examples of that at all. It was just like everyone just lifted up and had all of this energy. And that sometimes um, happens 
in quite extraordinary circumstances or crises. You hear of that quite naturally happening. So we're not talking about just a Buddhist thing here. So, you know, it's about when there's a strong crisis, you'll see sometimes people just come together. But I think largely what I was experiencing, a lot of it had to do with the fact that we had a shared vision, that we actually sort of knew what we had shared practices. We could just go into the shrine room and start doing them. So that was very connecting in a way. Um, and I heard many uh, comments from people who came to Adistana in those 10 days saying that they felt like they were walking into this realm of just this amazing realm of care, love and harmony. So they brought our teacher's body back to the site after he died and um, he was on site for 10 days. People came in waves from around the world to sort of um, visit and sit by his body and um, pay homage. Groups of friends and um, carpools and buses from centres arrived and they would go into the reception room and wait and um, and then go and have a certain amount of time in this room to go and see him. So it felt like there was this uh, beautiful... We were carried by this flow of gratitude and metta, loving-kindness. Um, people who had gone to courses there, there were lots of young Dharma courses, under 35s who had gone to live there for five months and study uh, Buddhist teachings. Some of those just sort of spontaneously arrived back saying, what can I do? You know, Because we had to transform this place for about 1,200 people to come to the funeral and for it to be uh, broadcast around the world. So all these spontaneous sort of offers um, were happening at the same time. And the funeral felt very much the same the day of the funeral, just a flow of loving kindness and gratitude. One of the people that was helping with the communications was supposed to be broadcast around the world. And, uh, of course, something went wrong at the last minute and the main stream didn't, wasn't working. So an order member named Manisha was um, holding up a phone, filming the, f the funeral on her iPhone, I think it was, and uh, she sort of had her hand like that and I walked past and there were people around her legs going like that with cables and trying to get it working. And later she told me that her first thought when she started holding up was, was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this for four hours. You know, It was about the two-hour ceremony and then procession to the, where he was buried. And then um, all these feeds started dropping down on her phone um, via, I don't know, however they come in. Um, from all over the world, people were just sending messages saying, like, it's amazing. I mean, someone dropped down a message from Mongolia saying, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm so grateful to be able to watch, you know, my teacher's funeral. And all these messages were coming in, order members who had gathered together in small numbers or who were alone watching it. And uh, as they came in, she just said, this energy came, and she just thought, of course I can. Of course I can. That's what I'll need to If that's what I need to do, I can do that. And I think she did largely hold it for the whole time but they managed to get something else going as well. It was very moving. And I read later a letter from an order member who had been on the periphery of the order a bit. You know, so he'd joined the order and he'd been involved for a while and then he'd sort of drifted away, not really feeling inspired or sort of really feeling that he wanted to keep going with what he was doing within the order. He was still an order member, he hadn't resigned. And I read a letter that he wrote where he said for some reason he was just drawn to get up and get to Adistana and, and, and be at the funeral, and he did that. And as, as he was driving away, he just had a deep sense of knowing why he was in the order. He had no way of putting it in words. He couldn't say why, he couldn't explain it, but he just knew why he was in the order. So perhaps that's got something to do with the Bodhicitta. So it's something... Uh, beyond ourselves but including ourselves was present and um, has great meaning, like incredible meaning. It includes all beings um, and it includes an attitude of love and care and wisdom. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, maybe that's why we don't try and really talk a lot about bodhicitta and explain it in words, which I'm having a go at tonight. What are the words best to use? Um, we just get a flavour of something that we intuitively know is true and possible. So Adastana is the name of the place where this all happened last year. It's the place where Banti's body is now buried. And he chose the name um, when the property was purchased a number of years ago. Adastana is a word that translates as grace waves or blessings. And that's what's available to all of us if we keep creating the conditions for the bodhicitta to arise for the benefit of all beings. And I think that's, the, in, in a way, in English words, that best explains what I felt part of was these waves of blessings and grace. So I want to um, finish by reading a passage from Bodhicharya this text I talked about with this ancient teacher, Shantideva. He was a scholar and a poet and a philosopher from around 700 CE. And there's this beautiful part in the text. And it says, At night in darkness, thick with clouds, a lightning flash gives a moment's brightness. So sometime, by the power of the Buddha, the mind of the world might for a moment turn to acts of merit. This being so, the power of good is always weak, while the, while the power of evil is vast and terrible. What other good could conquer that were there not the perfect awakening mind, the bodhicitta? So that's where I'll finish, expressing my gratitude for the opportunity that was given to many in our community around the world, actually, to experience, or for us over there, an extended period, I believe, of this lightning flash, giving many moments of brightness, where the mind of the world seemed, at least for ten days, to turn to the power of good, allowing love mode to flow so beautifully. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you.